James Wildman. Excellent. All right, we're recording. Okay, guys, um, we're going to start in a minute. Just want to wait for more people to show up. But since this is um, being broadcast pretty much for everybody uh, throughout the world, I just would like to know where everybody's from. So if you want to type in the chat box where you're from, I'm originally from New Jersey, South Orange, and uh, now I live in South Florida. So if you can, oh, Philippines, very nice. Arizona, New Zealand, Virginia. It's pretty amazing. Like I, <laughs> it's amazing what what technology has done. Where normally I'm just presenting to classroom, and of course the kids in the class can be from different places, but we're all over. It's definitely okay that you're here, Ithaca. Hi, Eric. All right, so we're still going to wait a couple more minutes. I want everybody to have the chance to come in. For those of you who just arrived, we're just typing in the chat box where we're from. Do so, please. Aha, <laughs> Janine. Brooklyn. In the house. Portland. Very nice. Colorado. This is really cool. Kansas, California. Hey, Sunny. <laughs> Got a big smile on my face. Australia, Argentina. So for those of you just arriving, just so you know, we're typing the chat box where we're from. I'd like everybody to feel like a big family. All are welcome. Let's give one more minute. All right, I think we'll get started. All right, good evening. My name is James Wildman and I'm the Humane Educator for the Animal Rights Foundation of Florida. Now, I do want to apologize in advance for any disturbances that might occur throughout this presentation. You see, I got two roommates who get quite rambunctious when I present and they haven't quite picked up on the concept of working from home. So I do apologize, but I got some dog treats, so hopefully they'll be on their best behavior. Now, I'm typically giving this presentation in a classroom setting with an audience in front of me. So to make the presentation more interactive, I've included a number of polling questions throughout the presentation. So when you see a box with a question, please feel free to choose the answer that you think is most appropriate. Let me show what I mean. Somebody's uh, just wanna, if you guys have a question, uh, cause I do see somebody's hands are raised, you can actually type in the Q and A box, your question. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have time for for me to answer those questions. You can also uh, type in the chat box, you can type comments or you can heckle if you'd like, whatever you so please. So heckling and comments in the chat box for questions, please type it in the Q and A. So here's my question for you. Okay, what would it take to inspire you to change something that you've been doing your whole life. So, would it take a miracle? Money? A lot of money. Or 60 minutes? Just another 10 seconds. All right, let's see the results. Well, unfortunately, 
I cannot provide miracles. And I don't have very much money, but I do have 60 minutes. So let's begin. Now, how many of you have seen the movie, The Matrix? Well, for those of you who haven't seen the movie, there's a scene at the very beginning of the film where the main character is presented with two pills, one blue, one red, and he has to make a choice. If he chooses the blue pill, he falls asleep, and when he wakes up, everything will be exactly the way it's always been. If he chooses the red pill, he finally learns the truth. I am here today to give you that red pill. So, what does the matrix look like? Let me show you. Now, despite what you might be thinking, these two circles are not equal. I repeat, these two circles are not equal. One is in fact larger than the other. What I need you to do is determine which one that is. So, do you think the blue is larger than the red? Or do you think the red is larger than the blue? Five seconds. All right, let's see what we got. Well, it looks like blue is the winner. Well, before I said anything about these two circles, what was your first instinct? In terms of their size, now they look the same. The reason why they look the same is because in fact, they are the same. These two circles are equal. So what did we learn? And you could be manipulated like that to believe in something that goes against natural instinct. And it doesn't take very much. Now just imagine if as a child, you were taught the lie that the blue circle is larger than the red, that the red is larger than the blue, that lie becomes part of your reality. And if you say the lie enough times, you actually convince yourself that's the truth. And if enough people are taught that lie, well, now that lie becomes part of the culture. And then if that culture passes that misinformation along to the next generation, their children, well, now that lie becomes tradition. And we have to remember is tradition and morality, what we believe to be right, are not always the same. Can you think of any traditions that we once had in the United States of America that thankfully today, we no longer have? I know some of you are from other countries, but perhaps you've had traditions that are no longer in your country as well. Here in the United States, Less than 200 years ago, slavery was a tradition in this country. Just over 100 years ago, women didn't have the right to vote. And less than 60 years ago, segregation was a part of this culture. But as we evolve as a culture, so do our traditions. So is our way of thinking. You see, the matrix is simply a story. And this story is being told again and again and again. In fact, if you believe the image on the carton is where you're getting your milk from, you're deceiving yourself. This is a fantasy. It only exists in your head. It's a blue pill fed to you by the industry to get you to buy their product. This is the matrix, the lie we tell ourselves about where our food is coming from. You see, the reality is far more disturbing. 90 to 95% of the milk, the meat, and the eggs that we consume in the United States are coming from these conditions. Now, this is called factory farming. This is where you take thousands of hens, pigs, and cows, you can find them into warehouses. In fact, every year in the United States, 9 billion, right? 9 billion cows, pigs, and chickens are being slaughtered for food. So what that works out to be is every second in the United States, 300 animals are killed, just like that. So 300, 600, 900, 1,200. By the time this presentation is over, over 1 million animals will have been slaughtered. Now, how is it possible that we can kill 300 animals like that without even questioning it? Because of the story. You see, the story justifies the action. In fact, if you say it enough times, you actually convince yourself that's the truth. So, how many of you were taught as a child that you need to eat meat to get protein. Well, looks like we we're all taught the same story. Okay, how about this one? How many of you were taught you need to drink cow's milk to get strong bones? Cow's milk. 
Not dog milk, not cat milk, not rat milk, not mouse milk, not elephant milk, not giraffe milk, not chimp milk, gorilla milk, not rhino milk, not hippo milk, not the milk from your own mother. No, you need to drink liquid secretions that drip, drip, drip from a cow's udder to get strong bones. Hmm. Well, let's find out if the story is the truth. Now, the first story that we've all been taught is that our diet is natural. Well, let's find out just how natural our diet really is. Let's take a three-year-old from any country in the world, put that three-year-old in the room and line up five animals in front of that three-year-old, a pig, a dog, a cow, a cat, and a chicken. You think the three-year-old's gonna know which one to pet and which one to eat? What's the three-year-old most likely gonna try to do? Pet them all. The three-year-old's been taught, no, 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 no. Don't pet the pig. Eat the pig, pet the dog, love the dog. This is what we were taught. We did not choose our diet. Our diet is a learned behavior. Our diet was chosen to us by our parents based upon a cultural story. If we grew up somewhere else, we might be eating dogs and cats right now. But I guarantee you this, if we were given the choice as a child, most of us would not be eating animals because most children don't wanna hurt animals and no child wanna pay somebody else to hurt the animal for them. Look, think about it this way. Put a baby in a crib, put in the right side of the baby chick, put left side of strawberry. Which one do you think the baby's gonna try to play with? And which one do you think the baby's gonna try to eat? Most likely the baby's gonna try to play with the thing that's moving and try to pick up the thing that's not moving, try to put it in their mouth. If the baby tries to eat the chick, what's the chick gonna do? Peck, scream, run away. Now, if you walked into a room with a baby in a crib, playing with a strawberry and chewing on the head of a live chick, <laughs> what would you think of this baby? You can allow this crazy, savage, psychotic, demonic, Satan baby play with your baby? So a play date? You see, if it's not right for a baby to cause harm to an animal, even when they don't know any better, why does it become more acceptable as we get older when we do know the difference between a baby chick and a strawberry? And the question is, do we actually find it acceptable to cause harm to an animal? Let's find out. If you were to walk outside right now and you saw somebody taking a baseball bat to a dog's head, what would you do? I guess you would intervene, you take action. And why? Because you recognize what it is. It's animal abuse, it's animal cruelty. But what about if you to walk outside right now and you saw somebody taking a baseball bat to a pig's head? Would you not do the same thing? Feel the same way? And why? Because you recognize the similarities between these two animals and not the differences. You know these two animals are equal, just like the two circles are equal. But all I do is tell you a story to go against your natural instinct. You know these two animals are equal, yet every time you sit down for a meal, you create that inequality doesn't actually exist. To change the baseball bat to a butcher's knife, change the man to pig from being outside to a factory farm far, far away. When it's out of sight, it's out of mind. We pay for that very thing we'd never want done in front of us. Look, think about it this way. Take two babies, one white, one black, put a room together. You think they care about the color of their skin? No, of course not. So what do they want to do? They just want to play. So racism is a learned behavior. Nobody is born a racist. Hatred is something that is taught passed down from generation to generation. We have been taught to view one animal differently from the other. We have been taught to believe that the dog deserves to live and the pig deserves to die. But in reality, we recognize their equality. We recognize they share the same needs and most importantly, we recognize they share the same feelings. In fact, would anybody argue with this statement? I imagine not. I mean, how many of you have a cat or dog, right? How do you know your cat or dog has feelings? You do know your cat or dog has feelings, right? Well, they're sounds. They bark, they purr, they howl, they whimper, they growl. Their movements, they run away when they're scared. They come up to you when they want attention. Dog might wag her tail if she's happy, put her tail to like she's upset. So there's sounds, their movements, and their facial expressions. Those like feel. But what about pain? Well, let's do a test. You take your hand, put over a flame. What happens? It burns. Your reaction? You're going to pull back and scream. You take a dog's paw, put it over a flame. What's his reaction? Same thing, pull back and scream. You take a pig's leg, put it over a flame. Same reaction. You take a dog, a pig, a cow, a chicken, a goat, a duck, a horse, a rat, a mouse, any animal something put by the flame, they all pull back and scream. You take a fish out of water, and what's their reaction? They flip flop. Why? They can't breathe. You want to know what it feels to be a fish out of water? Have your friend hold your head underwater and not let go. Of course, fish have feelings. They're not vegetables, not plants, not fruits. But if you take a vegetable plant, let's take a fruit, take a strawberry, put over a flame, what happens? 
doesn't have feet to run away, doesn't have wings to fly away, doesn't have fins to swim away. This is about mouth to scream, a nose to smell, two eyes to see, two ears to hear, a heart to beat, a mind to think. And before you say plants have feelings, there is not one plant on this planet that has a central nervous system. Without a central nervous system, broccoli cannot feel pain and happiness the way that animals and humans can. In fact, according to Daniel Chamovitz, Dean of Life Sciences at Tel Aviv University in Israel, and author of the book, What a Plant Knows, plants can feel themselves being eaten. Yes, they can feel themselves being eaten. They just don't have the capacity to give a shit. Animals do. Just about every animal on this planet is capable of experiencing pain. And just like most human beings, no animal wants to feel pain. No animal wants to die. And yet the funny thing is that we've actually been taught our whole life to love animals, to treat all animals with respect and compassion. I mean, just think about the movies that parents take their kids to see. Do any of these movies look familiar? And what are they all about? Farmed animals, even fish are being farmed. These are all about the animals we eat. And even though we eat them, we root for them too. Look, you might be having bacon every morning for breakfast, but nobody wants to see Wilbur made of bacon shots web. Now I guarantee there are thousands of people watching Chicken Run, rooting for the chicken saying, go chickens, go. Well, yeah, KFC bucket of chicken wings. How many kids watch the movie Babe, fall in love with Babe, and they go home that unknowingly serve Babe for dinner by their parents? We're teaching kids to love these animals and eat them too. And this is the closest thing you'll come to see their reality in the matrix, in the story that we've created. But today, we step outside that story. Now, the video I'm about to show you is where 90 to 95% of the meat, dairy, and eggs come from the United States. And let me make this very clear to you. I am not showing you the worst. What you're about to see is standard everyday procedure. And if you find it too upsetting, simply put your head down. But if you cannot bear to watch it, maybe you shouldn't be eating it. And it's only two minutes, so please don't leave. After the video, we will look at the health and environmental consequences of raising animals for food. By the way, the first scene you're gonna see in this video is a cow giving birth in a dairy farm. Pay close attention to what happens to the calf and the mother's reaction. Like I said, standard everyday procedure. And again, it's, it's only two minutes. If I could talk to animals that are being confined and, and abused now in factory farms, I would say I'm sorry for what we're doing to you. Um, I wish it wasn't this way, and I, I'm doing everything I know to stop it, and um, hopefully we will be able to stop it. There's not really a whole lot of good you can say. I mean, you just gotta, um, just gotta hope that it can stop, and hope that people will recognize the harm we're causing, and will choose a different way. Meat, milk, and eggs come from real animals. They don't just come from the grocery store. And these animals desire to live, and they want to be free of pain and suffering and fear. And on today's farms, these animals only know fear and pain at human hands. They never know human kindness. They never know mercy. And when people buy these products, they are unwittingly supporting that type of cruelty and that type of callousness. The workers, they have to lose part of their heart. You know, they have to lose, they have to shut their eyes to certain aspects of what they're doing. Can you imagine what it would be like to cut the throats of animals for eight hours a day? It's a bloody, violent job, and nobody should have to do it. I don't know what it means that, you know, we can participate in such cruelty without paying attention to it, without caring about it without wanting to do different. Citizens want to assume that animals will be treated humanely, that there are laws on the books to prevent cruelty. Uh, and people are usually surprised to learn there aren't. If people looked at what was happening, they'd be appalled. Most people would not support the type of abuse that has become common on factory farms.
if you replace the animals in that video with dogs and cats, would you feel any different? And would you do anything to stop it? Now, I've been giving this presentation for 15 years, and a lot has changed in that time. But the cruelty that we inflict upon cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, and fish have remained exactly the same. And we continue to justify it by the story that we've, that we've been told. Now, I know many of you will continue to eat meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. But please do not for one second think that it is necessary. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. Now, every one of you could smoke cigarettes. Do you think that's necessary? Now, you could smoke a pack of cigarettes every day for the rest of your life. And, well, you could live to 100. But what do you put your body at a greater risk of suffering from? Cancer. Heart disease. Look, you could eat meat, dairy, eggs, and fish your entire life. And, well, you could live to 100. But you also can put yourself at a higher risk of suffering from degenerative diseases. You see, these are the leading cause of death and disease in the United States. In fact, every 36 seconds, someone dies from heart disease. Every 40 seconds, someone suffers a stroke. And every day, 4,900 people are diagnosed with cancer in the United States. 4,900 every day. So how many of you know someone or knew someone who has or had cancer? Sixteen out of seventeen know or knew someone who has or had cancer. And the saddest part about this is that does it surprise anyone? The stories that we tell each other that are part of our culture have made us blind to the facts around us. More people are dying from cancer and heart disease than ever before. In fact, how many of you know someone? who had a heart attack. Again, does this surprise anyone? One more. How many of you know someone who has diabetes? This isn't good. So let me ask you something. Which box are you gonna fall into? Now, have you ever heard of a gorilla in the wild suffering from type 2 diabetes? You ever heard of a tiger suffering from atherosclerosis? You ever heard of an obese wildebeest? These animals don't suffer from these diseases because they're eating what's in their best interest. Perhaps we are not eating what is in our best interest. And yes, I am fully aware that some animals eat other animals. I get that. That's because one, they don't have a choice. Animals don't have a choice. We do. It's not like you're going to find a bunch of tigers sitting in their bedrooms on a Zoom conference talking about how deer have feelings and the benefits of tofu. And two, it isn't the best interest for a tiger to hunt, kill, and eat a deer. And besides, when did the actions of animals, that some animals eat other animals, become a justification for how we should act? It's funny because everybody wants to eat like a caveman, but nobody wants to live in a cave. Oh, and if you're wondering about the circle of life, <laughs> what are you, Simba? This isn't the Lion King. This is a nightmare. 365 days of the year, and you're playing the villain. Yet most people are opposed to animal cruelty. Most people don't want animals to suffer. Yet most people don't want the killing to stop. No, they just want the killing to be done in a nicer way. You know, like kosher, halal, humane slaughter. <laughs> humane slaughter? What the hell is that? Is that we like rub a pig's belly, fume some milk and cookies, and chop his head off? Because if I did that to one of you, would everybody be like, well, at least she got her milk and cookies? 
Instead of trying to create a nicer system of killing, maybe it's time we stop the system of killing. And I know some of you might be thinking, yeah, but if I don't buy the bacon, somebody else will. So what does it matter, right? And what kind of logic is that? Is that the same logic you apply to the rest of your life? Because I guarantee when you go to bed tonight, some bad stuff is going to happen. Somebody's going to get shot and somebody's going to get robbed. Does that mean tomorrow morning when you wake up, you're going to be like, oh, man, you know what? I'm going to go rob somebody. Because it's going to happen no matter what. If you don't agree with murder and theft, don't participate in it. If you don't agree with what you saw in that video, you don't have to participate in it. It's completely unnecessary. So let's take a look we are participating in, how it affects the animals, our health, and the health of this planet. Now, these are battery cages. 95% of the eggs that we consume in the United States are coming from these conditions. A battery cage is literally the size of a milk crate. Four to five hens be put in a cage this size and have their beaks burned off without any painkillers. Why'd they burn their beaks off? Because they become aggressive towards each other in these conditions. They're not naturally aggressive. It'd be like if I took five of you, put you in a corner, sealed it off, and kept you there for 48 hours straight. Now, you could be best friends going in, but I guarantee after 48 hours, you're probably not going to be in the best of terms. So how does the industry solve this problem? Simple. Create a label. Cage-free. Free range. Sounds pretty good. Looks pretty good, too, right? Well, here's a cage-free farm, Virginia. See, according to the egg industry, this is what freedom looks like. Now, what's your definition of freedom? Does this apply? Cage-free, free range, it's just the label. It allows us to feel better for participating in, doesn't mean very much for the animals. What about organic, though? We've all heard that's healthier, right? Well, considering that 70% of all the antibiotics produced in the United States are fed to farmed animals, 70%, oh, which, by the way, might help explain why 35,000 people die from antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections every year in the United States. So organic, it's got to be healthier, right? Well, for fruits and vegetables, it is. For meat, dairy, eggs, and fish, it ain't. You see, organic simply is to do with the food the animals are fed. No antibiotics, no pesticides, and no added hormones. And I say added hormones because we eat young animals. We eat animals under the age of one. These animals are still growing, meaning they have naturally occurring growth hormones in their body at the time of slaughter. So no added hormones, no antibiotics, and no pesticides. Now, these are three things you do not want to put in your body. However, organic has very little to do with conditions the animals are raised in. In fact, this is an organic egg farm, Wisconsin. So let me ask you something. Where did these animals go to the bathroom? And where do they eat? And where do they sleep? They eat, sleep, and defecate all in the same spot. Now, does that sound healthy to you? Even on old McDonald's farm, and good luck finding it, all male chicks born in the egg industry are thrown out at birth. The day they are born is the day they die. Why does the egg industry kill all the male chicks? They don't produce. They don't lay eggs. They don't go fast and meat. They don't fit in the equation. So they're doing all of this just so that we can eat this. Well, might as well get know what it is. What is an egg? What do you put in your body? And please don't say a baby chick. This is not a baby chick. It's not a fetus or an embryo either. It, it can't be because not fertilized, which is good news because seriously, why would you want to eat an abortion? So what is it? It's an unfertilized egg, which doesn't sound too bad at all. Except when you realize that once a month, a woman will shed an unfertilized egg if she's not pregnant. What's that called? Congratulations, you're eating a hen's period. It's the unfertilized reproductive cycle of a hen. However, this is not a menstruation cycle. It's not a menstruation cycle because one, there's no blood and two, they're not mammals. But it is the expulsion of an unfertilized egg, which by any other name is called a period. Now, you don't need to eat a hen's period any more than you need to eat a dog's period, a cat's period, or a woman's period. You don't need to eat anybody's period. And any nutritional benefit you get from a hen's period, you can get from a plant without the high cholesterol. You see, your body naturally makes cholesterol. Your body makes all the cholesterol you need. There's only type of good cholesterol your body makes. Any cholesterol you bring in from the outside is bad. Meat, dairy, eggs, and fish all contain ridiculously high amounts of cholesterol. And when you have high cholesterol, can that lead to? Heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, and ultimately death. Remember, too much cholesterol can clog arteries. Clogged arteries lack of blood flow, which lead to a heart attack, or lack of oxygen to the brain, which lead to a stroke. In fact, heart disease is the leading cause of death in the United States, as well as Europe, killing 655,000 Americans 
every year. <laughs> but hey, let's not forget, though, that happy cows come from California. But even your happy cows in California hooked to the machines. Now, when does a cow start producing milk? When will she produce milk? She's got to be pregnant. She's got to give birth. She's a mammal. And like all mammals, she has to be pregnant to produce milk. It's not like she's a magical cow that can produce milk on command. So has a cow become pregnant? Right? She has to be pregnant. So how does a cow become pregnant? No sex in the farm. The farmer's not going to wait for a cow and a bull to get on. He's not going to set the mood, light some candles, put in some drake. Is that a cow pregnant without the bull? Artificial insemination. See, the crazy that I would do this to my female dog, if I were to artificially inseminate my female dog so I could take my dog's milk and put on my cereal, you would say, what are you out of your freaking mind? And when it's done to a cow, it's considered normal. So um, what's your definition of normal? Okay, now she's pregnant. She gives birth. What happens to her baby? Taken away. All male calves born in Darren Street are immediately taken to their mother, chained by the neck to a wooden crate, deprived mother's milk, been an inefficient diet, will never be able to turn around, will never see live day, and will live like this for eight to 18 weeks, at which point he'll then be shipped off to slaughter and converted to what we call veal. Veal is just a nice way, of, nice way of saying young, sick, baby, male calf. If you are drinking cow's milk, the only reason is because a male calf chained to a box isn't. Why do this to the male calf for the dairy industry? As opposed to a female, how is a male different? He doesn't produce, just like the male chicks in the egg industry. They don't make any money. But the female, oh, well, she does. And she would grow up to be just like her mother, which is a constant cycle of artificial impregnation, birth, and milking. But she, too, would be taken away from her mother. Why take the female calf away from her mother? What happens if she stays? What's she going to do? Oh, drink the milk. We don't want that, do we? So I think the cow feels having her baby torn away from her. Well, the same way that you would feel if you had a baby and baby's torn away from you. It's called stress. Stress is the hormone cortisol released throughout the body. These animals are born into a life of stress. You do not pasteurize the stress out. It becomes part of the flesh, part of the meat, and part of the milk. Now, after about five years, the dairy cow no longer produces enough milk. She becomes unprofitable. What happens to all the unprofitable dairy cows in the dairy industry? Oh, they don't come to Florida to retire. They get shipped off to slaughter, give her to hamburger meat. You ever wonder why it costs 99 cents for a hamper McDonald's? It's because it's coming the most sick, abused animal on the planet. Animals too sick to even stand up. You pay for what you get. Oh, and just so we're clear, cows are producing 10 times the amount of milk they produce in nature. The hooked machines two to three times a day. These machines that utter has caused bruising, swelling, and lacerations, cuts. The machine cannot tell the difference between milk and blood. That means that every glass of milk you drink, even after it's pasteurized, because remember, pasteurization is not a removal process. It is a cooking sanitation process. So every glass of milk you drink contains a little bit of blood and a little bit of pus. You know what pus is, right? Pus is when you have a pimple and you pop nasty white stuff that comes out. That's what you need milk and cheese. Bon appetit. Now, biologically speaking, okay, biologically speaking, in nature, who is a cow producing milk for? Her baby, her calf, her young, not for us. Just like when your mom was pregnant with you. Who is she producing milk for? For you, not for your daddy, not for the neighbor, not for the mailman, not for the dog, and not for the cat. Now, if your daddy was drinking your mother's milk, mother's pregnant with you, well, then your daddy was stealing your milk. If you're drinking cow's milk, you're stealing his milk. You see, where do all these animals get their milk from? Their mothers. We're the only species on this planet that take the milk from another animal. And if you don't think that's weird, if I brought a pregnant dog into your room right now, how many of you would be like, okay, maybe just a little? And when do these animals stop consuming milk? After infancy, we're the only species on this planet that continue drinking milk into adulthood. And if you really don't think it's weird to be drinking milk at your age and older, I mean, think about this. If your mom was pregnant, how many of you go up to your mom and say, hey, mom, can I have some of your milk? Yeah, don't, 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 don't do that. If you're walking up like any supermarket, all right, like, I don't know if you're here in the U.S., like, Whole Foods or Trader Joe's or wherever it might be, go to any supermarket, right? Pick up a milk cart. Instead of a happy cartoon cow on the cover, there's a picture of a happy cartoon chimpanzee. What you're holding in your hand right now is chimp milk on sale, two for one. What do you think? Now, why would it be nasty and disgusting to take the milk from a chimp and not nasty and disgusting to take the milk from a cow? Oh, because you've been told a story. But you know what? If you're drinking cow's milk and you can find yourself some chimp milk, I say make the switch. 
as disgusting as it is, it actually makes more sense if human beings take the milk from a chimp than a cow. Why might that be? I don't know, maybe because they share about 98% of our DNA. Look, if you're going to take the milk from any animal, wouldn't you want to take animals closest to us? Last I checked, we don't look anything like a cow. Look, a calf at birth weighs 90 pounds. That calf grew to 500 pounds in nine months. They can put on 410 pounds in under a year. Man, there's only one product in nature that can make an animal grow that fast. What's that? Hormones. And that's what milk is. Milk is composed of natural during growth hormones. And if you're thinking you're drinking organic milk and not getting those growth hormones, think again. This is organic milk. It doesn't say no hormones. It says no added hormones. It'd be like I said to you, I got some peanut butter with no added peanuts. Peanut butter is peanuts. Cow's milk is a growth hormone. And this growth hormone is meant for one animal and one animal only. A cow. Look, you have milk is specific species. Here's what I mean. A cow grew to 2,000 pounds in two years because they drink the mother's milk, cow milk, growth hormones meant for baby calf as an infant. Why put growth hormones meant for a 2,000 pound animal into this? Logically speaking, it's illogical. In fact, this might help explain why girls are having their first period at a much younger age than they did 40, 50 years. So how do you justify the logical act? You create a story. Now, every story has an author. Who is the author of this story? Who came up with this quote? The dairy industry. And what is the ultimate goal of the dairy industry? Look, is this about your health or is it about money? Because what about if I said to you there's a new story going around? Bacon, it does a body good. Would you believe that? Like nobody's eating bacon for health reasons. Nobody goes on a bacon diet. It doesn't do a body good. In fact, the World Health Organization classifies processed meat and red meat as probable cause of cancer, in particular colon, prostate, and pancreatic cancers. So obviously bacon doesn't do a body good. So what's it high in? Saturated fat, cholesterol, sodium, and nitrates. Well, guess what? Milk and cheese is loaded with saturated fat and loaded with cholesterol. In fact, how many glasses of milk? Oh, hold on one second. A quick question for you guys. How many glasses of milk does the United States government recommend a day? All right. And, and keep in mind, uh, the, the, the plate that we have in the US and the pyramid, apparently the pyramid wasn't easy enough for people. They create a plate. So the plate has dairy. Like, like there's a whole section for dairy, right? Like there's not a section for broccoli or carrots or asparagus. There's not a section for oranges. No, there's a whole section for dairy. How the hell did that happen? I don't know. Maybe they had some influence in creating the plate and the pyramid. Well, let us, let's find out what we think. One glass, two to three glasses, eight glasses. You know what's funny? Actually, a couple of years ago, I'm asking this question in a, in, a, in a classroom in South Florida, and some kid screams out, 16 glasses. Well, first of all, that's not even like an option in my, my question, but who the hell drinks 16 glasses of anything in a day? All right, share results. All right, well, yes, it is two to three glasses a day. So if you were to follow the government's advice and drink three glasses of 2% milk, not whole milk, three glasses of 2% milk have the same amount of cholesterol as 15 slices of bacon. If I said to you, you need to eat 15 slices of bacon every day for the rest of your life to be healthy, would you believe that? In fact, I've got another question for you. What percentage of the human population is lactose intolerant? 25%, 45%, 65%. All right. And let's see what we got. Well, all right. Maybe you guys can explain this to me, all right? Because if milk does a body good, if milk does a body good, why would 65% of the human population be lactose intolerant? 65%. You know, if I said like 65% of the human population is intolerant to broccoli, do you think broccoli would be being sold in the, in the supermarket? 65% of the human population is lactose dollar. You know what? I'm, I'm going to put that another way. Five 
billion people are lactose intolerant. Five billion with a B. Five billion people are lactose intolerant. That means that two every three people on this planet, when they drink milk or eat cheese, and what is cheese? Just spoiled rotten milk. They suffer one of these symptoms. Diarrhea, stomachache, gasness, bloated, cramps, ear infection, excess mucus. If you suffer many symptoms when you drink milk, eat cheese, congratulations. You're normal. It is normal to be lactose intolerant. Here's the reason why. All mammals, and human beings are mammals, have an enzyme known as lactase. Put an A right where the O is in lactose. That enzyme breaks down the sugar known as lactose. However, as all mammals mature, including human beings, we lose that enzyme. This is why you don't see like dogs nursing on their mother after infancy and cats nursing on the mother after infancy. This is why you're not going to like, you know, go and nurse on your mother or some woman because you're not an infant. And if you did, it'd be freaking disgusting. But hey, it must be good for kids, right? Because every school I've been to, you can be guaranteed that cow's milk will be served in the cafeteria. Yet cow's milk is one of the most common food allergies among infant children. So how do you justify the logical acts? Oh, right. The story. Okay, well, maybe you guys can answer this question for me. What's in cow's milk that builds strong bones? Or better put, what builds strong bones? Calcium, exercise, vitamin D, all of the above. All right, so let's see the results. Yes, all of the above. Well, here's the thing. Calcium does build strong bones, but just as important as calcium is exercise. I mean, think about it. If all you do all day is consume calcium, but it's in your couch, but consume calcium, but it's in your couch, are you gonna have strong bones? Of course not, you get exercise. Whether you're running, jogging, jump ropes, push-ups, pull-ups, weight activities, playing a sport, doing yoga, you have to exercise. Also important for strong bones, vitamin D. Vitamin D is added to cow's milk. You know, the original source of vitamin D, the sun, and it's free. All you need is about 10 to 15 minutes sunlight day, which is in here in South Florida, it's not a problem. I don't know where you might be from, but it's not a problem here in South Florida. So vitamin D, exercise, and calcium are important for strong bones. But my question for you is, is this the best source of calcium for human beings? Well, let's find out. What countries drink a lot of cow's milk? What do you think? United States, England, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Canada. It's pretty much North American Europe. Although if you go to any South Florida school, some kid will always scream out Florida. Now, countries with highest rates of osteoporosis. Okay, well, let me ask you guys a question. What is osteoporosis? Respiratory disease, loss of bone density, a sleep disorder. See how you guys compare to high school kids in South Florida. Ah, oh, very good. All right, congratulations, we're all correct. Yes, you can actually break osteoporosis into two words, okay? So osteo, osteo is bones, porous is holes, so it's literally holes in the bones or loss of bone density, degeneration of the bones, brittle bones, weak bones. Now, remember, you've been taught, drink cow's milk, get strong bones. So what country got the highest rate of weak bones? The United States, England, Sweden, Finland. Uh, by the way, uh, Florida would also be on this list. Well, that, that sucks because, I mean, I thought all we do is drink a glass of cow's milk to get strong bones. It, it, it's funny that's where we're taught, yet why does every supermarket sell calcium supplements? No, 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 no. Seriously, why would we need why would we need calcium stuff in the United States when we can't even go a day without eating cheese? If milk does a body good, why would 53 million Americans either suffer from osteoporosis or be at high risk of getting it? 53 million? Man, I thought cow's milk was supposed to do the trick. The thing is, that's all it is. It's just a trick. In fact, a Harvard University study that followed 75,000 women for 12 years showed that increased intake of calcium dairy products did not lower the risk of osteoporosis. So what about your cereal? Problem solved in the milk from the plants. Soy milk, rice milk, oat milk, hemp milk, flax milk, cashew milk, coconut milk, almond milk. They even have hazelnut milk. They got macadamia milk. They got pea milk, which is like the worst name for a milk, but it comes from peas. They come in four flavors, vanilla, chocolate, unsweetened, and original. I guarantee you'll like at least one. And the great thing with these plant milks is they all contain the exact amount of calcium as cow's milk, 300 milligrams per cup. So what's the difference? 
There's no side effects. There's no blood, no pus, no cholesterol, little snow saturated fat, no animal growth hormones, and no stress hormones. Look, no animal has to suffer or die for your appetite or your health. Now, this is all well and good for your cereal, but to be honest, if you want calcium, just go directly to the source. Fruits and vegetables like dark leafy greens, collard greens, broccoli, kale, nuts, seeds, and beans are loaded with calcium. And the dark leafy greens and beans are also loaded with iron. In fact, who is the largest land animal on earth? Dinosaur, whale, elephant. By the way, these are actual answers given by high school kids in South Florida. So if you're thinking dinosaur, you're in good company. Uh, all right, well, it's not dinosaur. Um, the elephant is the largest land animal on earth. And what does the elephant's diet consist of? Plants. Are you gonna tell an elephant you start drinking cow's milk for strong bones? He gets all his cows from the plants. Now these plants look healthy. Well, here's what's not healthy. 68% of all diseases are diet related, right? 68%, and this is a US government statistic. Now I got some good news, I got some bad news. Bad news, that means at three to five, you could become part of the statistic if you don't change what you eat. The good news, 68% of all diseases are preventable. Is the 68% of all diseases coming from the image on the left or the right? Have you ever heard of somebody suffering a heart attack because they had too many oranges, sweet potatoes, and broccoli? In fact, what clogs arteries? Cholesterol and saturated fat, bread, or Vegemite for all my Australian friends out there. I've never personally had Vegemite, so my arteries are super good. Yeah, it, it's not bread. And it's not Vegemite either. Congratulations. Cholesterol and saturated fat clog arteries. Well, guess what? Animal products are loaded with cholesterol. Plants don't contain any dietary cholesterol. Animal products, high in saturated fat. Plants, little to no saturated fat. And you get no fiber from the animal product. And what is fiber good for? Going to the bathroom, taking a crap. If you have trouble doing it, eat some more plants. Fiber is only found in plants. And you get no complex carbohydrates from the animal product. You need complex carbohydrates for energies, which your body runs on. It's the original fuel for your brain. Complex carbohydrates only found in plants, like root vegetables, beans, peas, lentils, whole grains. However, not all carbohydrates create equal. You want complex carbohydrates, and you want to avoid simple refined carbohydrates. Let me give you some examples of simple refined carbohydrates. White flour, white sugar, white bread. If it's white, it ain't right. Once you go black, you can't go back. When I do this like in a high school classroom, like all the, all the white kids are like, what the hell? And all the black kids started high-fiving each other. By the way, Coca-Cola is the devil, okay? So look, our diets are way too high in sugar and way too high in sodium. So without a doubt, this is definitely part of the 68% of all diseases. And look, as much as I despise these corporations, hey, at least they're not coming out and saying it does a body good because that's exactly what the meat, dairy, egg, and fish are doing. Look, we live in a culture that feeds off the of sickness, disease, and ignorance. Uh, let me prove it to you. So when you watch TV, what commercials do you see for food? Uh, give me some of the commercials. A lot of kids will be like, I, I don't want, I, like kids don't watch TV anymore. They're just watching like Netflix and Hulu and all that stuff. But there's still commercials. And if you're even listening to, when anybody listening to radio, I don't know, there's still commercials out there. So what commercials do you see for food? All right, you got McDevils. You got Murder King, Domino's, Pizza Hut, Papa John's, Red Lobster, Outback Steakhouse, Chili's, Arby's, Sonic. What are they all trying to sell you? Meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. You're not seeing commercials for like broccoli, cauliflower, fruits, vegetables, and sprout organic tofu. No, it's meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. And then what commercials do you see in between the meat, dairy, eggs, and fish? Oh, you need some Pepto-Bismo? Have some Rolaids, maybe some Tums. You got a heartburn? Don't worry, we got you covered. Need some Metamucil? Have some in the fiber diet? Can take a shit? Don't worry, we got you covered. Need some Citric Acid, some Caltrate? You got weak bones, osteoporosis? Don't worry, we got you covered. Need some Weight Watchers, Epigenic Reg, Diet Pills, Overweight? Don't worry, we got you covered. Need some Lipid Swab, it's Crestorm, it's Avatrol, get high blood pressure, high cholesterol? Don't worry, we got you covered. Need some Levitra, it's Viagra, can't get it up? Don't worry, we got you covered. It's funny how all the foods that we're told we're supposed to eat now comes its own pill. So how do you adjust the phonological acts? Oh, right, the story. Look, there's over 11 million vegetarians in the United States. Have you ever heard of a vegetarian going to the hospital for lack of protein? It's unheard of. In fact, the number one question I get asked 
all the time is, James, man, what about your protein? Where do you get your protein from? I get it from the supermarket. Where do you get yours from? It's not about where you get your protein. It's about how many grams of protein do you need? So my question for you is, how many grams of protein does the average male, female adult need? Average. 10 to 30 grams, 40 to 60 grams, 80 to 100 grams. Ooh, this is a close one. Another second. All right. Share the results. All right. Yes, it is a 40 to 60 grams. According to the World Health Organization, all you need is about 40 to 60 grams of protein per day. All right. That also would go with the CDC. Now, if you are an athlete, you can double, triple, quadruple this, but please let me show you how easy it is to get 40, 60 grams of protein without eating meat, dairy, eggs, or fish. You take a cup of beans, a cup of brown rice, and a cup of broccoli. It's very healthy, nutritious, inexpensive meals. Meals, dirt cheap, and you get over 25 grams of protein. Just like that, you're halfway there. A pea brown jelly sandwich on whole wheat bread with a glass of soy milk has about 20 grams of protein. One can, okay, one can of kidney beans has 24 grams of protein. Now, I'm not a big fan of buying canned foods, but I do want to show you how ridiculously easy and cheap it is to get protein. One cup of almonds, 28 grams of protein. Everything you see up here is composed of protein. As long as you get enough calories, you'll get enough protein. As long as you eat food and Americans have no problem eating, you'll get enough protein. In fact, you can get every essential amino acid from plants. But I do have a confession. I love chicken. I love chicken. But the chicken I eat does not come from a dead carcass of a chicken. No, it might come from a plant. It's called veggie chicken. However, it looks and tastes the same to the chicken you eat. The reason why is because they smoke it, cook it, grill it, fry it, bake it, and put the same spices, herbs, and seasoning that you put on dead chickens to make dead chickens taste good. Look, you're not eating meat for flavor. You're eating meat for texture. If you think you're eating meat for flavor, go outside, find yourself a squirrel, and eat them. Nobody looks at roadkill and goes, oh, that looks pretty appetizing. You have to decorate death. If you can put a man or woman on the moon, how hard is it make to, to make a plant taste like a chicken? It's, it's not that hard. This will fool even the biggest meat eater. Most supermarkets sell it. Each box has 44 grams of protein. There's just as much protein the veggie chicken as actual chicken. And if you're not in the mood for chicken, Here's a veggie burger. It's made from pea protein. It's got 20 grams of protein. Or you can have a veggie dog. This is made from wheat gluten. It's got 20 grams of protein, which by the way, is twice the amount of protein found in a hot dog. And here's a cliff bar. It's a granola bar. It's made from nothing but plants. It's got 20 grams of protein. It costs $1.50 at most supermarkets. You spend $3 and you pretty much be all set for your protein for the day. This is how ridiculously easy it is to get protein. You don't need about getting enough. You'll get enough. The problem is getting too much. The average American is getting over 100 grams of protein per day, double we're supposed to be getting. That is why, or that is perhaps why, 30% of children and 65% of adults are considered overweight in the United States. We have one of the highest rates of obesity in the entire world, and yet we continue talking about protein. We've got some kind of deficiency. Even our dogs and cats are overweight. And yes, I know I'm a skinny white guy talking about protein without eating meat. But these athletes aren't skinny and they all get enough protein. None of them eat meat. They're all vegetarians. So please do not tell me you need to eat dead animals to excel at your sport because these athletes are just fine without it. In fact, in 2017, half of the Tennessee Titans defensive linemen adopted a plant-based diet. If you don't think you gain muscle mass on a plant-based diet, um, maybe you should talk to these guys. The largest, strongest land animals on earth are primarily herbivorous. And they also live the longest. Go figure. Now, think of your body as a car. you got to put the right fuel in to get to work properly. You don't put the right fuel, it ain't going to work. If you don't take proper care of your car, it's not going to last as long. If you don't take proper care of your body, it's not going to last as long. This is the right fuel for your body. This is where all nutrients originate from. Where do you think animals get their source of protein, calcium, iron, vitamins, and minerals? They get it from the plants. And then other animals eat those animals got from the plants. We need animals in the secondary source. Look, the higher up you go in the food chain, the more energy you lose. It's just not efficient to be on top. In fact, let me show you how inefficient and idiotic our diet actually is. Let's take black beans and broccoli. 
It's healthy, nutritious, inexpensive, it's dirt cheap, and it provides with protein, calcium, and iron. But instead of eating the black beans and broccoli directly to get the protein, calcium, and iron, you're going to feed the black beans and broccoli to me, so I get the protein, calcium, and iron. And what are you going to do? Oh, kick, kill me, cook me, and eat me. Cut the middleman out. Why are you filtering your nutrients through somebody else's body? Go directly to the source. Now, if you don't like pyramids, if you like anti-pyramid, if you got something against pyramids, here's a plate. This is the right fuel for our body, according to our anatomy. Although we are omnivorous in our ability to eat both plants and animals, we, however, look more similar to herbivores than omnivores or carnivores. How so? Our teeth. Y yes, I know you have canine teeth. Congratulations. Most herbivores want to have canine teeth. If you think your canine teeth are sharp, take a look at our dog. They have fangs meant to rip through flesh. Ours are pretty dull and flat compared to theirs. Plus, we have more teeth like all herbivores on this planet because we chew our food. Those of you who have a cat or dog, when you feed them, what do they do? They swallow, limited chewing. In fact, real omnivores, real carnivores, their jaws are nice and wide. Like a chopping motion, jaw goes up and down, up and down. Think of an alligator, crocodile. Herbivores, including humans, our jaw goes side to side. We grind our food. We chew our food like horses and cows. If you're chewing gum right now, you know what I'm talking about. If we're meant to be on top of the food chain, don't you think we'd have some claws to rip through flesh? In fact, if I brought a pig into your room right now and asked you to kill the pig with your claws, oh, the pig would probably enjoy it more than anything else. Oh, and just because we can create weapons like bow and arrows, knives, and guns, um, uh, how does that change your anatomy, especially your intestines? Look, our digestive tract, like all herbivores on the planet, are really long. Real omnivores, real carnivores, their digestive tract is shorter in length. So whose food travels out faster? Simba's, which is good because you can call it bacon as much as you want. Once in your body, it's no longer bacon. It's a dead animal. It's decomposing flesh. It's a rotting corpse. It's bacteria, which might help explain why we feel the need to cook dead animals, unlike real omnivores and carnivores. Now, I cannot leave without talking about fish. What do these two things have in common? You ever take a thermometer, break a moment, drink the liquid? Of course not. Every time you eat fish, you do near that exact same thing. We flew the ocean to such a great extent, the BP oil spill and that nuclear disaster in Japan. Oh, by the way, there was just like another like oil spill in, in the off of uh, California. Um, so <laughs> happens every day. We just don't always talk about it. Just because we don't talk about it doesn't mean it went away. We've polluted the ocean to such a great extent. There's a warning label on fish. It says... Nearly all fish and seafood contain some amount of mercury, uh, chemicals known to cause cancer, birth defects, and other reproductive harm. Uh, pregnant nursing women, women who become, may, may become pregnant, and young children should not the following fish, including tuna. In fact, what else does the government tell women not to consume when they're pregnant? Alcohol, cigarettes, and drugs. Although I did have one student once say peanut butter, which that just doesn't make any sense. But yeah, alcohol, cigarettes, and drugs. So uh, basically, the government's saying, hey, look, if you think about becoming pregnant, lay off the alcohol, lay off the cigarettes, lay off the drugs. Oh, and um, stop eating fish. If fish can cause a woman's body and the child's body this much harm, why would anybody want to eat it? The omega-3, the brain food in fish, gets canceled out by the mercury poisoning and the high cholesterol. You get omega-3 from flax seeds, hemp seeds, chia seeds, and walnuts, plants, without the cholesterol, without the mercury poisoning. Oh, and um, speaking of pollution, I don't know if you noticed in that video, but there was tons of... You see, when you raise 9 billion cows, pigs, chicken, turkeys for food, it generates a lot of waste. In fact, animal agriculture produces 130 times more excrement than the entire U.S. population. That is a lot of, <gasps> so where's it all going? Our rivers and streams. Animal agriculture is the leading cause of blue rivers and streams in the United States. The meat and dairy industries are using our rivers and streams as a toilet. And no, that is not chocolate. And it's not just affecting our water supply and our soil, it's affecting the air as well. You see, all this waste generates lots of gases, in particular methane, which is 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. In fact, raising animals for food generates more greenhouse gases than all the cars, planes, ships, and trains in the world combined. Oh, and um, let's not forget, though, that animal agriculture is the leading cause of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon. The fires raging the Amazon have been raging for decades. It's just now, but somebody decided to talk about it. It's happened because cattle ranchers burn the rainforest so they can graze cattle so we can have beef. But all of this is completely unsustainable and a complete waste of resources. Look, it takes more land, more water, and more crops to raise animals for food than to just grow plants directly for human consumption. In fact, in terms of land, it takes about 164 square feet of land to produce just one pound of beef. Yet it takes only 12 square feet of land to produce one pound of Beyond Meat, a plant-based burger made from pea protein. 
In terms of water, it takes about 520 gallons of water to produce just one pound of chicken. Yet it takes only 302 gallons of water to produce one pound of tofu, which, by the way, has more iron, calcium, and protein per calories than chicken. In terms of milk, it takes about 880 gallons of water to produce just one gallon of cow's milk. Yet it takes only 250 gallons of water to produce one gallon of soy milk. And in terms of crops, 50% of the grains grown worldwide are fed to farmed animals instead of people. 40% of the corn grown in the United States is consumed by livestock, poultry, and fish. We're feeding corn to fish. And 70% of the soybeans grown in the United States are fed to cows, pigs, and chickens. 70%. So if you have an irrational fear of soy, I suggest you stop eating animals because most of the soy grown in the United States is fed to farmed animals. So all this soy, corn, and other grains we grow to feed animals instead of people. And yet for some reason, every 3.6 seconds, someone dies of starvation. One, two, three. Something is seriously screwed up with the story that we've been told. Some stories are just not worth repeating. It is time for a new story, a story based upon health and compassion. And that story begins with you. It begins with what you eat. And that's the big question. James, what the hell do you eat? Look, you're not going to see me on my hands and knees. You want grass. I eat everything you eat. There's no sacrifice. The sacrifice when it's eating meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. I'll sacrifice the animal's life, my health, and the health of this planet. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, but it's more expensive though, right? Well, first off, I don't mind spectra dollar on my almond milk, coconut milk, or oat milk if it's healthier for me, and it is. I'm saving money in the long run, less medical bills in the future. But you also remember it's about supply and demand and the economies of scale. When there's a higher demand, there's an increase in supply, which lowers the cost. That's why soy milk is just cheap as cow's milk. But I do find it funny how everybody seems to be so concerned about the price of organic fruits and vegetables, yet they have no problem dropping 150 in a pair of Air Jordans. People are more concerned with what they wear in their body than what they put in their body. But I got good news. If you actually give a damn about your health, the healthiest food on the planet is the cheapest food on the planet. Fruits and vegetables, beans, peas, lentils, whole grains like brown rice, oatmeal, quinoa, nuts, and seeds are the healthiest and cheapest food on the planet. You do not have to spend a lot of money to be healthy. Now, this is what I like to call transition food. Keyword, transition. This will help you replace the meat, dairy, eggs, and fish. And even though this is processed food, which is obviously not as healthy as this, it's still healthy for you, for animals, and for the environment. So if you're in the United States, 85 to 95 to 100%, you know, you can find in most supermarkets. Um, if you're somewhere else in another country, you can find similar, maybe not the same brand, but similar ones as well. And you can also make these as well. Like if you like plant milks, you can make them yourself. You can make oat milk. You just take a bunch of oats, put it in a blender, add water, blend it up, and strain it out. That's oat milk. You don't even have to strain it. You can do the same with cashews. Take a bunch of cashews, put it in a blender, add water, blend it up, and that's it. That's cashew milk. Now, if you want to sweeten up, you can use dates, the healthiest way of doing it. It's a fruit. If you don't like dates, you can use organic maple syrup. You can use unrefined cane juice. You can use agave syrup or some stevia. So let's go shopping. Instead of dairy, soy butter instead of cow butter. It tastes exactly the same. Coconut milk yogurt instead of cow milk yogurt. Non-dairy cream cheese put in your bagel. Non-dairy ranch dressing to put in salad. They even have an egg-free mayonnaise. They even have an egg-free egg. It's called the Just Egg. You can find it at most supermarkets. Dairy-free cheese, about a half a dozen in the market. Find the ones you like. So you can still have your nachos, your mac and cheese, and your pizza, but it's dairy-free, cruelty-free, cholesterol-free. Dare free ice cream, hands down, the best ice cream in the world. Coconut milk cookie dough ice cream. Now, if you don't like coconuts, don't worry, because it's got almond milk ice cream, soy milk ice cream, cashew milk ice cream. I got four alternatives to your one. Even Breyers, Haagen Dazs, and Ben and Jerry's now offer dare free ice cream using almond milk instead of cow's milk. Just look for the non dairy words in the bottom. Actually, um, I had a, a student tell me that the best way you can tell about Ben and Jerry's being vegan is that it's missing the cow. So there's no cow in the front. So, no cow. And it's dairy free. Instead of poultry, I think it actually should have a cow being like, yes. All right. Um, instead of poultry, uh, we got chicken free chicken strips, veggie chicken nuggets, barbecue wings, veggie barbecue wings, veggie buffalo wings. They even have veggie turkey for Thanksgiving. Yeah, if you're in a different country, you don't celebrate this absurd holiday of massacring millions of turkeys one day a year. But we do have it here in the United States. And this is what my Thanksgiving looked like no meat, no dairy, no eggs were used, no animal to suffer or die for my appetite. Not even on Thanksgiving. Instead of beef, 
veggie burgers. There are dozens in the market. Find the ones you like. Don't buy the ones you don't like. My personal favorite, the Beyond Meat Burger, found in most supermarkets and TGI Fries and Burger Fi now sell as well. This burger looks like meat, smells like meat, tastes like meat, but it ain't meat. Also check out Gardein. Gardein has over two dozen products in the market. Every supermarket sells Gardein. And if you're here in like the Florida area, Publix does a lot of two for one sales end up being pretty cheap. So they got veggie chicken, veggie turkey, veggie beef, veggie pork. They have veggie fish products instead of pork. They got veggie dogs, veggie sausages, veggie ham, veggie bacon. They even have veggie pepperoni going dairy-free cheese pizza. And finally, instead of fish, they got veggie tuna, veggie crab cakes, veggie shrimp, and veggie fish fillet. So instead of being a sea animal, I'm eating a sea vegetable. Now, if you're looking for these products, look for the word vegan, look for the vegan symbol, or simply read the ingredients. A vegan is somebody that chooses not in the animal products. No meat, no dairy, no eggs, no fish, nothing from an animal. This is different from a vegetarian. A vegetarian still has dairy and eggs. Now, before you say it's hard to be vegan, half your diet is already vegan. Fruits and vegetables, rice and beans, pasta, spaghetti, nuts, seeds, baked potato, primo J sandwich, corn, the cob is all vegan. In fact, everything you see up here is vegan. There's no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no fish. It's all cruelty free. It's all cholesterol free. It is all vegan. Kids love this slide. However, before you get excited, if you're a kid or not, this is all crap, okay? If this is what your diet looks like, you're going to die. This is terrible food. Just because something's vegan doesn't mean it's healthy. However, a whole foods vegan diet of fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, nuts, and seeds is the best way to keep saturated fat intake low and avoid dietary cholesterol completely. In fact, according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the largest organization of dietitians and nutrition in the United States, appropriately planned vegan diets are healthful, nutritionally adequate, and may provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. Well-planned vegan diets are appropriate for individuals during all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, adolescence, older adulthood, and for athletes. So let me show you some healthier vegan foods. Scrambled tofu instead of scrambled hen periods for breakfast. Fruit salad. Vegan waffles with soy butter and maple syrup. Spaghetti with marinara sauce. Nachos, vegan cheese, vegan sour cream, guacamole and salsa. Vegan cheese in the pizza. If you're in the Florida area, this is from Blaze Pizza. They offer vegan cheese, it's actually quite good. This is the Beyond Meat Burger, found at Burger Fi, TJ Fridays and most supermarkets. Remember when you have a veggie dog, it's all about the condiments, spices, the herbs, season you put on it. Now it's real easy to bake without any eggs. You can use egg replaces, bananas, applesauce, dates. They even have a vegan egg on the market. They got vegan chocolate chips going your vegan cookie. And this is coconut milk ice cream on a vegan brownie with maple syrup for top. And I got some more good news. You can still go to your shitty ass restaurants. All these restaurants have vegan options. Denny's has a veggie burger. I can't believe I'm saying this. Denny's has something good. They're using the Beyond Meat Burger the same way you can find at Burger Fine and TGI Fridays. Starbucks has soy milk, almond milk, coconut milk, and oat milk. Again, Blaze Pizza offers vegan cheese to replace the cow cheese in the pizza. Toxic Hell has a bean burrito. Just get rid of the blood and the pus. No dairy, no sour cream, no cheese. Love on the rice, beans, guacamole, and salsa. Subway's a veggie sub. It's called the Veggie Delight. Makes your ass with Italian bread. Also has avocado. Say no cheese, no mayo. Use mustard, dope on the veggies. Chipotle has a vegan burrito to go with a coli. It's called sofritas. They use tofu, Mary tasting texture of chicken and Olive Garden. Oh man, Olive Garden, one step above a Denny's. But if you like Olive Garden, they got spaghetti, pasta, penne with tomato sauce is vegan. Their minestrone soup is vegan and their almond breadsticks are actually vegan. And I got even more good news. Murder King has an all vegan burger. It's scary good. It's called the Impossible Whopper and it's got no cholesterol. It's got less saturated fat. It's got 17 grams of protein and it uses 95% less land. 74% less water and produces 87% less greenhouse gas emissions, only cost a dollar more. For an extra dollar, you can buy a burger that's healthy for you, healthy for animals, and healthy for the planet. Now, it's funny, even after all this, I still hear a lot of people say, I don't know, James, it sounds pretty difficult to be vegan. No, it's not difficult to be vegan. You know what's difficult? Climbing Mount Everest, okay? That's, that's difficult. Going to the supermarket and buying almond milk instead of cow's milk is not difficult. In fact, let me show you how easy it can be. For breakfast, let's take a bagel. Some vegan dairy-free cream cheese, oatmeal, almond milk, and some fruit. Healthy, nutritious, inexpensive. For lunch, we got two slices of whole wheat bread, some veggie and egg-free mayonnaise out of this world. Every supermarket sells it. Two slices tomato, 
lettuce, veggie bacon, sweet potato fries. You get a BLT that's cruelty-free, cholesterol-free. And finally, for dinner, we got pasta with marinara sauce, meatless meatballs by Gardein. They have a vegan dairy-free Parmesan cheese but on top. They had a salad, some Italian dressing. No meat, no dairy, no eggs, no animal to suffer, die for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Now, if you try to go vegan, let's say you go vegan for a month, a week, or even just a day, and then you slip up, you eat some chicken. It's not the end of the world. Well, it is for the chicken. But it doesn't mean you can't try again. Look, I don't know why, but for some reason, people think that vegan is like a one and done deal. Like, pff, I, I tried it once. Look, if you try to go vegan, you had to have a reason. Nobody does anything for no reason. So my guess is you probably care about animals. Most people do. You probably care about your health. Most people do. You might care about the environment. Eh, some people do. So it's okay to slip up, but to not try again, what does that mean? You don't care about animals anymore? You don't care about your health anymore? You don't care about the environment anymore? It's okay to slip up. Just don't give up. Because look, e even if you only go vegan for one meal a day or one day of the week, it's better not going vegan at all. Because every meal that you go vegan, you make a difference. You make a difference for the animals, for your health, for the environment, and you inspire others to make the difference as well. When this presentation ends today, you have the opportunity to make a difference. Now, when I talk to youth especially, uh, a lot of them don't really have a choice. And when I talk to adults, I hear the same complaints like, well, what about family and friends and partners, uh, loved ones? You know, first off, you should never have to compromise your health and compassion for someone else's ignorance. But if you are concerned about family, friends, coworkers, whoever it might be, sometimes the best way to get through to somebody's mind is to go through their stomach. So if you're concerned about family and friends, make them a vegan meal, something really basic, inexpensive, like a spaghetti with marinara sauce and meatless meatballs. Just do not tell them it's vegan, right? Do not tell them it's vegan, right? If they, if they, when they eat it, after they like it, I mean, after they eat it, if, if they like it, tell them it's vegan. If they don't like it, don't tell them it's vegan. But if they like it, tell them it's vegan and, and tell them what that means. No animal to suffer die, which means there's no cholesterol, little to no stir fat, no animal growth hormones, no stress hormones. And it's got the same amount of protein. It's just a win-win situation. Now, look, you don't have to go vegan all at once. You can do it one day at a time, one step at a time. Easiest way to start out, meatless Mondays, just one day of the week, you're not eating meat. That's really not too much to ask. In fact, you could probably get your friends and family on board as well. And after doing meatless Mondays for a few weeks, another week, add Wednesdays. And a few weeks later, add Fridays. Pretty soon the whole week would be meatless. Look, keep in mind, this is, this is not a sacrifice, okay? This is not a sacrifice. I'm not asking anything up. All I'm asking you to do is replace. Just replace all your meat products with veggie meat products. Instead of having a hamburger, have a veggie burger. Go to TJ Fries. Go to Burger Fry. Go to Denny's. Get the Beyond Meat Burger. Go to Murder King. Get the Impossible Whopper. Instead of having meatballs, have meatless meatballs. They taste the same. Instead of having a hot dog, have a veggie dog. Instead of having chicken, have veggie chicken. Just stay positive. Stay focused. Stay strong. So if I'm in a classroom, I actually have a vegan shopping guide to offer students. Uh, but since we're doing this virtual, I created a vegan starter kit. So um, you can actually download this uh, onto your phone or your, your tablet or your, uh, your, your computer. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put the link to the starter kit in the chat box right now. And uh, on the starter kit is my email, james at arff.org. So if you have any questions later on, please feel free to email me. So let me just put the link to the starter kit. And then I really quickly want to show you what the starter kit looks like. So let me do this to everyone. All right, and uh, I'll just put my email as well, even though it's on the show, uh, on the starter kit. So I, I just put that in the chat box. So let me show you what the starter kit looks like. There we go. All right, so. Everything that I just talked about in the presentation is in the starter kit. So it's a, it's a lot of information, but it's all useful information. So here is your vegan food plate. If you like pyramids, I'm sorry, I went with the plate. Here is the position on vegan diets from the largest organization of dietitians in the United States. So if you're concerned about family and friends, definitely show them this. And this is this is this is my my bread and butter, soy bread, soy uh, soy butter and bread. Uh, these next four slides are probably the most important in this starter kit. And just because this is just where all nutrients are from. So if you care about animals, if you care about the environment, if you care about your health, try to eat lower on the food chain. So you can actually go to the United States Department of Agriculture. They have a, a food data central and you can type in any product or ingredient. Like you can type in broccoli and it'll come up with the nutrition content for that, for that item. You can type in cow's milk or soy milk or whatever it might be. So these are the top eight plant sources of protein, calcium, iron, omega-3, complex carbs, fiber, vitamin A, vitamin B12, 
vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, iodine, magnesium, potassium, and zinc. It's just one ingredient. Every supermarket sells them. Everything from your dark leafy greens, your vegetables, your fruits, your nuts, your seeds, your sea vegetables, your uh, legumes, beans, peas, lentils, and your whole grains. Again, brown, brown rice, quinoa, uh, oatmeal, stuff like that. Here's your protein myth. By the way, Kyrie Irving, Novak Djokovic, Tom Brady, DeAndre Hopkins, Chris Paul have all adopted a plant-based diet. They may not be 100% vegan, but they're on that path. And here are your top 10 plant protein sources. Number one, one cup of peanuts is 35 grams of protein. This is how ridiculously easy and cheap it is to get protein. A lot of people ask me about B12 and omega-3 and, and iron. Um, the funny thing about B12 is, yeah, like actually vegans do have a, a lower level than, than meat eaters and vegetarians. Um, but it's, it, it's, what's really interesting is that it's most farms are actually injecting B12 into the animal. So like, you know, is taking a supplement for B12, which I do take, is that natural? No, but is wearing clothes natural? No. Is being on a zoom meeting natural? Nothing we do driving cars, flying planes, nothing that humans do is, is in nature. We're so out, outside of nature and everybody is supplemented because if you're eating animals, they're getting supplemented. So there's no such thing as a supplement free diet. I mean, even if you're like, you know, I guess if you're killing the animal, but well, that's a whole other ethical issue in itself. Um, so you can get uh, all the plant milks from soy milk to almond milk to coconut milk to oat milk is fortified with B12. Nutritional yeast uh, can be fortified with B12, has a very cheesy like flavor. Iron, vegans don't get heme iron, which absorbs better than non-heme iron. But if you combine, let's say beans, which are very high in iron with uh, spinach or actually better source would be like kale and broccoli, um, that has a high vitamin C. And so it makes the iron absorb just as well as heme iron. So uh, you can also eat broccoli and kale and collard greens um, to get iron because it has vitamin C. So it makes it absorb well. Um, Omega-3, uh, yeah, vegans don't get EPA or DHA. Um, they get the ALA. So as long as you eat enough ALA, um, it, such as flax seeds, hemp seeds, chia seeds, and walnuts, um, it will convert to EPA and DHA. Vitamin D, you know, depending on where you live, vitamin D, the best source is the sun. Just be careful of the skin cancer. And then calcium. Uh, for every myth I give you, I want to give you alternatives. So here are a dozen plant milks you can find at most supermarkets. And if you can't find them, you can make them yourself. Here are some vegan alternatives to dairy. Just want to give you a sample size. If you like ice cream sandwiches, you like yogurt, you like ranch dressing, you don't have to give anything up. Eggs, no, it's cracked up to be high in calories, high in saturated fat, high in cholesterol. So here are some vegan alternatives to eggs. The middle, by the way, this thing called black salt. Oh my God, this will blow your mind. Black salt has a very high sulfur content. So it literally tastes exactly like the yolk of a hard boiled egg. So if you put like a little bit of black salt on a salad, it would make the salad taste like it has egg in it. You can also make scrambled tofu and use a little black salt and that will help as well. There's also the just egg, which is made from mung beans. Very good as well. If you like to bake, it's incredibly easy to bake without any eggs, easy as using bananas, applesauce, tofu, and beans. Vegan alternatives to poultry. Vegan alternatives to beef. Vegan alternatives to pork. Your fish warning. And of course, your vegan alternatives to fish and seafood. So look, if you decide to go vegan, your pantry, your fridge, and your freezer might look something like this. And here are about 99 vegan products. Here's your vegan shopping guide. I think it's actually kind of funny when people are like, don't you miss out? Don't you crave? Don't you cheat? Like, no, I don't cheat because I eat whatever I want to eat. Like, there's no reason to cheat because whatever I crave, I end up getting. I love cheeseburgers. I just replace cow's meat with Beyond Meat. I replace cow cheese slices with vegan cheese slices. I replace mayonnaise with veginase. And it does cost me an extra dollar, two or three dollars, but I don't mind spending extra money if it's about my health, the animal's health and the environment. Uh, it is funny how people are willing to spend a thousand dollars on the latest iPhone. I get it. It makes you happy, but it doesn't make you healthy. There's nothing more important than your health or an animal's health or the environment. Meatless meatballs, spaghetti with meatless meatballs. It's actually dirt cheap. I still have a BLT sandwich, but it's veggie bacon. Replace cow's milk with almond milk or soy milk or oat milk or coconut milk. Replace cow milk yogurt with soy milk yogurt or coconut milk yogurt or oat milk yogurt. Replace a hot dog with a veggie dog. I still have turkey sandwiches, but it's veggie turkey. Avocado is a very good uh, healthy fat. Vegan tacos. Vegan chili. And then chicken stir fry. Now I like to go out to eat more than my wallet can handle. I love Chinese food. In fact, my favorite dish is General Tso's tofu. In fact, every Chinese food restaurant replaces meat with tofu. They can replace an egg roll with a spring roll. Indian food is anywhere from like, I don't know, 20% to like 40% vegan, so that's pretty simple. Mexican, I love bean burritos, chips, guacamole, salsa, and plantains. 
And then I love Middle Eastern Mediterranean food, uh, falafel sandwiches and hummus and tabbouleh. And then Thai and Japanese, I love sushi, but it's, it's veggie sushi. And look, hey, look, you can still destroy your body on fast food. Uh, so remember, uh, these are some fast food vegan options. Murder King has the impossible Whopper, just say no mayo. And McDevils is gonna come out with a, a McPlant eventually. Um, here are some common non-vegan ingredients. Please read ingredients. If you cannot pronounce an ingredient, maybe you shouldn't put in your body. If you know what that ingredient is, go online and go, go to Google and find out. And then finally, some vegan recipes. I don't like to cook, so I tried to make this real simple. Seven ingredients or less, under 15 minutes to make, everyday ingredients, minimal cost. So your first recipe is for chickpea tuna. Four ingredients, can of chickpeas, onion, celery. The key ingredient is veginase. Takes about five, 10 to make. You're not even cooking, you're just chopping it up. Scrambled tofu, five ingredients, pump it up, add one more, add black salt. And I swear to God, you think you're eating scrambled eggs. Bean burger, a healthy way to make a burger. Breakfast smoothie every morning, six ingredients, five minutes to make, it's dirt cheap. Frozen organic fruits and vegetables tend to, tend to be dirt cheap and they also tend to be fresher. So you pick them right when they're ripe. Chocolate oat milk, five ingredients, five minutes to make. Vegan pancakes, six ingredients, about 10 to 15 minutes to make. Chocolate mousse, four ingredients. Make sure the avocados are nice and ripe, about five minutes to make. And then finally, oatmeal banana cookies. So look, if you like to cook, check out these, re uh, these resources. If you like to go out to eat, check out happycow.net. It has a list of all the vegan-friendly restaurants everywhere, like everywhere. I say like I live in South Florida. So everywhere in South Florida, as well as the state, as well as the country, as well as the planet. So definitely check out happycow.net. If you want more information on, on resources and if you want more information on animal rights, definitely check out uh, the organization I work for, Animal Rights Foundation of Florida. And I do want to really quickly talk about the Animal Rights Foundation of Florida. The Animal Rights Foundation of Florida is a nonprofit organization that has been promoting respect and compassion for animals since 1989. Our work includes spreading compassion in Florida schools, which I do, fighting animal abuse in the circus, which we've done, and we, uh, we were successful in getting Ringling to uh, basically no longer perform, protecting Florida's wildlife, speaking up for animals in farms and laboratories, and strengthening laws to protect animals. For over a quarter of a century, ARF has been Florida's strongest and leading voice for animals. So to learn more about ARF, uh, please visit our webpage, arff.org, and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash animals Florida. You can also sign up for our email action alerts to get active for animals. And if you'd like to support our work, you can make a tax deductible donation by visiting arf.org. And if you're interested in scheduling a free presentation, please contact me, james at arff.org. So we go through all of South Florida uh, providing free presentations. If you are outside of Florida, um, we can also do this virtually as well. So if you are interested in that. And finally, I would also like to thank um, Eric Lindstrom, uh, the executive director of Farm Animal Rights Movement, for creating this platform, giving me and other animal rights activists the opportunity to spread the message of compassion and empathy. Now, Farm has been advocating for animal rights and veganism since 1976. In fact, when I first went vegan almost 20 years ago, I was given a farm meat out pamphlet, which I still have to this day. So definitely check out Farm's webpage, uh, which is farmusa.org, and their other social media pages. I also want to give a big thank you to Lisa D. She's been a huge help in getting this series off the ground. So thank you, Lisa. Um, I can't wait to see what you guys are going to do next, which just so happens to be me. I will be giving another presentation next Sunday, same time, 8 p.m. Eastern time on um, wildlife conservation. So we're going to look at the relationship between humans, animals, and the environments we share and how best we can protect endangered species. We'll also be taking a critical look at animals living in captivity. So circuses, zoos, and marine parks. And that, that, that is a very fun presentation. So please, if you'd like, you can sign up for that. You can go to uh, farmusa.org uh, uh, backslash James Wildman, uh, same way that you signed up for this one, you can sign up for that one. And on October 17th, so the 